Alrighty, so this is a 2004 R6, and today we have kind of a unique opportunity. Painting the gas tank in the new rear fender. So, that gives us the ability to talk about how a motorcycle works. We have the tank off, we have the seat and all the electronics exposed, and we have kind of a unique view for the time being of the interior of the motorcycle. This is how a motorcycle works. Really quite fabulous machines, um, quite ingenious to be honest. There's been a lot of thought and a lot of development in the last hundred years for motorcycles. Engines, just like people and many other organisms, breathe. So you have the engine sucking in air and fuel, just like your lungs would, and then it combusts it, unlike your lungs, combusts it, and then expels it through your exhaust. So, in a lot of ways, um, an engine is a lot like a set of lungs. It needs air to be able to operate and it needs to be able to expel byproducts to be able to operate. You have an air box right here and your air box houses an air filter. Obviously you don't want to clog up the engine. Um, so you have a filter that filters out contaminants out of the air. That's all housed in your air box. Now your air box is connected to what they call the throttle body. The throttle body is right underneath here. We can't quite see it and it is the top of the engine essentially. Right into the air box, suck in air. Well, through these tiny little holes. Now, behind these holes, you see the little, there's a little wall. Well, up above that wall, there's a filter. Air is sucked through here and has to travel up, over and into the filter. Now, the reason it's built like that is so that water obviously is not good for an engine. It'll actually kill it. Um, because unlike gasoline and air, water is not compressible. So if you put water into those pistons, the pistons will stop. And since they're all connected, they all die, and the engine is what you call hydrolocked. Uh, essentially, you just totaled your engine, so you don't want to do that. So, obviously, you can't run in the rain. Well, that's actually not true, you can. And it's because of this little design. Because of that wall, water is heavy. Gravity affects it, it falls. Air is not, air is light, and it's actually a gas technically so it expands to fill its container. Now under a vacuum water will typically still fall unless the vacuum is very great. Now air is lighter than water so air will float in a lesser vacuum than water will. You need a heavier vacuum for water to be sucked. So because of the vacuum provided and because of that wall water will hit that wall and fall down to the bottom of the air box. Air will not. Air will hit that wall and continue to be sucked up through the air box and into the air filter. Thus, you have filtered out rainwater. Now, obviously, you can't go shooting a hose or anything in there, but highway speeds in the rain, not a problem. That is how the air is supplied to the throttle body. Now, all of that air is sucked into the throttle body, and then there it's mixed with fuel and squirted into the head of the engine. Two ways that that happens. This happens to be what they call a fuel-injected bike, so that process that I just described, the fact that air and fuel are mixed perfectly and then squirted into the engine where they're combusted, that's called fuel that injection. happens electronically. Now there's another way, and it's called carburation. It's slightly different. It's not electric. It's all done manually. And basically, if you've ever started a chainsaw or, or a leaf blower perhaps, you'll notice that you have to adjust the choke when you first start it because it can't um, the air ratio isn't quite right, so you have to manually adjust that air ratio so that it's running what they call rich, mostly on gasoline, so that you can start up that vacuum and get it sucking air, um, in which case you readjust your choke and it, it minimizes that fuel mixture a little bit more, uh, and you run less rich with less gasoline, so you're a little more efficient, um, a little bit better for the engine as well. So, that's the difference between carburation and fuel injection. Fuel injected bikes typically run a little bit better in my opinion, um, especially in the winter time. Um, in colder temperatures, carbureted engines tend to have a little bit of trouble starting, uh, but it's not impossible. Uh, a lot of people run carbureted bikes in very cold climates. Look at Russia and Canada. Um, anyway, moving on. You have that. this mixture going into your engine where it's exploded. Now you have a piston. This explosion happens just above the piston, right where my finger would be if my fist is the piston. That explosion drives the piston down. Now, in this particular engine, you have many different types, but in this particular engine, this is a, a four-cylinder engine. So that means there's one, two, three, four pistons, and one, two, three, four chambers on top of each of those pistons where gasoline is exploded to drive those pistons. 
Now, those pistons are connected on one singular rod that's called a crankshaft. Those pistons drive up and down and it rotates the crankshaft via a bunch of little pulleys that are connected to the bottom of these pistons. Now it's very hard to visualize and I'm not computer savvy, otherwise I would make a model on the computer. I really wish I could do that, but I can't. So I'm going to explain this as best as I can. As those pistons drive, this crankshaft turns. Now, that crankshaft is connected to your transmission. All right. Now, motorcycles are all manual transmissions, so you have what's called a clutch. A lot of people have very mixed understandings of what a clutch actually does. It's very, very simple. Now, an engine works because the gasoline is exploding, right? And it's driving those pistons. Now, the gears are what provides power from the engine via the transmission to the rear wheel via your sprocket and chain on the other side of the transmission. If the transmission isn't moving and the gears are connected to the engine, that means your rear wheel isn't moving and those gears are connected to the engine, how can the crankshaft move? Well, it can't because the rear wheel is stopped and that force is actually greater than the engine can provide. All right, so the engine stops. To prevent that, you have what is called a clutch. Think of it like this. The clutch is a mechanism that is driven by a spring, all right, and a lever that under spring tension connects the transmission to the engine, all right? Now, you can pull a lever and it disengages those springs and the transmission disconnects from the engine in layman's terms. This is a very, very, very basic description. It's actually a little more complicated than that, but for the purpose, it serves quite well, I, I hope. So, you disconnect the transmission from the engine. That means that tr the transmission can be at speed zero, not moving, but the engine can still move. So, if you connect them and you're still not moving, the engine won't be able to move the bike because there's no power supplied, so it dies, Actually, it stalls. What the transmission and the clutch do is the clutch allows the transmission to disconnect from the engine so that the engine can run and the transmission cannot be running. So the bike can be stopped and the engine inside the transmission you have your clutch. The clutch is the mechanism that disconnects the transmission from the engine. The way it does this is think of sandpaper. Think of two sandpaper discs. Sandpaper has what they call friction. When you rub it against something else it wants to grab and pull it with it. That's that's friction, all right? Now, think of these two paper sandpaper discs. They're not actually sandpaper, but like I said, um, for the time being it helps to visualize this. So, you've got two sandpaper discs. When the lever is released on the clutch uh, lever, those two discs press against each other. Now, the transmission has a sandpaper disc and the engine has a sandpaper disc. When they mesh together, they want to turn together. When you pull them apart, only the engine one is turning, whereas the transmission stops and goes to zero. So, that's going into what I'm talking about, stalling and applying power. When you apply power to the engine and you mesh those two discs, when you apply power, it's enough to move your rear wheel. The transmission moves with the engine. If you don't apply power, it's the, the engine does not have enough, just idling enough power to move the disc on, connected to the transmission. So those two discs are meshed, and when you don't apply power and you mesh those two discs, the transmission, since it is stopped and the engine doesn't have enough power to move it by itself without supplying more via the throttle, the engine actually dies. That's why it stalls. And that's where we get more into the clutch. Those discs are what we call friction discs. They align with an opposing disc on the That's engine. how your clutch works. It, it allows you to connect and disconnect power from the engine to the transmission. Now, if we come around the other side of the bike, this is how the transmission provides drive to the rear wheel you have what you call a chain and sprocket set. This is a sprocket, this is a sprocket, and this is a chain. Exact opposite side of the transmission as the clutch. So when the, the transmission and the engine are connected, the friction disc that connects to, in the transmission that connects to the engine is right here. So when the transmission and engine are connected, it pushes this. So when you apply power via the throttle, this is what turns. Now, this little, this is what they call a countershaft. 
Other people in layman's terms call it a front sprocket. Either is fine. When you apply power, this little wheel rotates and it pulls this chain. And you'll notice the chain, the sprocket, is connected to your rear wheel. That's what gives you drive. All of that combustion, all those little explosions, well, explosions generate heat, don't they? Uh, we know that from basic physics and chemistry. Explosion, the byproduct of an explosion is heat. Uh, one of the byproducts, at least. So, how does the engine not get too hot? Well, sometimes they do. It's called overheating. But that simply means that the system used to mitigate the engine heat is not working. It used to be back in the day, we had these things called radiators. Now, some, some vehicles or bikes don't have radiators. A lot of modern designs, especially uh, a couple, couple of bikes from Harley-Davidson kind of come to mind, uh, have special designs where they're called air-cooled. Now, you have two types of cooling mechanisms for modern vehicles. You have liquid-cooled and you have air-cooled. This air is a liquid-cooled bike. This has a radiator. A radiator sits in an accessible location in the front of the vehicle or the bike and allows air to pass through it. So you see it's very porous. It's got these little microscopic tiny little holes in there. Well, each of these is a little vein and has what they call engine coolant. It's a special formula that in the wintertime keeps the engine from freezing and in the summertime keeps the engine from overheating. So it's a dual purpose liquid. It's actually pretty cool. Um, and that liquid is circulated via a pump, a vacuum, through these tiny little veins. Now the air rushing over it cools it off, at which point it is then circulated back through tiny little veins in the engine to bring the engine temperature down to make sure the engine doesn't overheat and cause damage to the metal casing and the pistons and all the internal parts of the engine. On an air-cooled vehicle, it's a totally different system. You don't even have a radiator. So the engine is configured in such a way and accessible that the air itself passing by it cools off the engine, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. So now we're going to talk a little bit about your forward front controls. You have basic controls. You have two handlebars. One of them moves, one of them does not. This handlebar right here moves. This is called the throttle. Now, if, any, if you've ever ridden a motorcycle or an ATV or anything like that, you know this already. That's all right. So, when you pull this back, it releases a mechanism on the other side of the bike, on sport bikes at least, right here. This is the throttle assembly. So when I pull this back, it rotates that wheel. That squirts more gasoline into the engine, which causes a larger explosion, which thus gives you a little bit more power. So, essentially, you control your speed by using this little hand grip right here. Moving past that, this is your front forward brake. How this brake system works is you pull this lever in, and you'll notice if you follow this mechanism up, it's connected to this really odd looking tube with a bunch of weird amber colored liquid in there. Every braking system has this on modern vehicles, including cars. This is called a master cylinder, all right? Each brake, each set of brakes should have a master cylinder, front and rear. This is what provides hydraulic pressure via a tube or braided brake lines down to your caliper. It's a caliper. A caliper houses your brake pads. Remember what we talked about earlier with the clutch and friction? Well, braking is the same basic thing. These two pads in between this steel rotor which is connected to the wheel, when you apply that amber colored liquid, when you push your brake lever in, it squeezes that liquid down this tube and forces your pads on either side of this rotor to squeeze against the rotor, which then provides friction against the rotor, and it squeezes it and tells it to stop, essentially. The friction makes it harder and harder to keep going, and if you don't supply power via the throttle, if you let off the throttle, and squeeze the brakes, that friction will eventually stop the motorcycle. Thus you have brake, the hydraulic fluid, brake fluid commonly known as, through these lines there's a little piston in here and when you actuate this lever this little piston right here is pushed up and it forcibly squeezes the fluid via a vacuum caused by the piston through this little tube and into there which then compresses those brake pads together against the rotor and allows you to stop. On bikes, and some vehicles as well, you have front and rear. In fact, most modern vehicles have front and rear. A bike works a little bit different though. Your rear brake is completely separate. That is your rear brake. So, same system, you have a master cylinder for the rear brake, and you have a piston system. In fact, it's actually right here. So, you'll notice when I actuate this lever, it drives that piston up, and it forces the fluid 
all along your brake lines and into your pistons where it compresses those two pads against the rear rotor, allowing the bike to provide stopping power. Left hand controls, you have what you would call a clutch lever. What the clutch lever does is engage and disengage the clutch discs in the transmission. That is the basics of how a motorcycle works. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please do feel free to write down. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have found this at the very least educational, if not incredibly irritating. Thank you very much for watching. Have a very pleasant day.